topic for um, for people who have already been diagnosed, which is most likely uh, who've been diagnosed with myositis. And I thought about this, uh, and I thought if if you are um, if your myositis is is uh, coasting along and, and everything is going well, and then things start to decline, if you start getting worse. We're going to go through the same process again, so it's still kind of relevant, I think, to know what other things can look like myositis and um, and the process that we go through to to uh, figure out what's going on. So the way that medicine works is uh, we have this um, sort of this format of it's a formula uh, because things are complicated and it's hard to uh, make sense out of a complicated story, especially when you're dealing with rare conditions. Uh, so we use this, uh, we use this pattern of, of uh, presenting information and recording information uh, called SOAP notes. And SOAP stands for Subjective, Objective, Assessment, and Plan. And so subjective is what you tell me, what's going on, when did it start, what makes it worse, what makes it better. And objective uh, it would be things like labs and biopsies and, and EMGs and uh, examination, physical uh, uh, exam reflexes. And, uh, and then assessment is trying to put it all together to say, uh, here's the problem, here's what I think, here's what's causing the issue, and, uh, and what we know and what we don't know. And then plan is where do we go from here? Um, with this information. So the subjective part is uh, where you come in and you talk to the doctor and, and the doctor says, what's going on? Why are you here? Uh, what's new? Or, uh, and whatever you say is the biggest problem. That becomes the chief concern or chief complaint. And so everything that we do in terms of getting more history, getting more of the story that's going on is related to that chief complaint. And so if you come to me for your myositis and you tell me that for the last week you've had this terrible headache, I'm, I'm going to focus on the headache uh, because you're telling me that that's your biggest concern. And so, um, so uh, if you want to get answers about uh, your headache, then talk about your headache. If you want to get answers about your myositis, then make sure you, you bring that up as a as a major concern, the reason that you're uh, seeing the doctor that day. So the chief concern, the chief complaint, the initial complaint, um, you, normally with myositis, it's weakness. Um, I don't know if anyone here, if their initial symptom was trouble swallowing, but that can happen. Uh, certainly with IBM, um, swallowing problems can be the first uh, symptom. Uh, with dermatomyositis, the first symptom might be some kind of rash, some kind of skin changes. Um, most people have some amount of muscle pain, muscle aches, um, myalgias. Some, a lot of people will have joint pains, arthralgias. Uh, some people will present with uh, trouble breathing, being short of breath. And some people will have other other complaints, weight loss, fatigue, night sweats, uh, fevers, things like that. So if we have the chief complaint, let's say weakness is the main symptom, uh, then I want to know when did it start? How did it start? Did it start all of a sudden? Because uh, my ascites doesn't usually happen one afternoon. Most people don't remember which day their myositis started. They can tell you maybe what month, certainly what year, but saying it started on Tuesday, April 22nd, that, that's not going to happen. Um, if, if you can tell me what day your symptoms started, then I'm going to worry that is this a stroke? Is this, uh, is this a, some kind of uh, uh, trauma or something else? Because uh, myositis tends to creep up uh, could be slowly, it could be very slowly, it could be something that you, you think it started in 2012, uh, but you can't say what part of 2012. 
uh, uh, we also want to know, so that's the onset, that we want to know what is it, what are you feeling? Uh, uh, you, if you, uh, I've actually had people say, uh, my arm went numb, and, and by numb they meant weak, and when I hear numb, I think, you know, numb, you can't feel it. Uh, sensory change, but uh, uh, you have to make sure that you, uh, that, that you are understanding what they are, what, what the symptom is that, that your patient is describing. So, uh, where is this problem? The location is important because uh, there are some types of uh, myositis that affect the arms uh, more than the legs or certain parts of the arms, like the muscles that grip um, could be affected in IBM. Uh, muscles that help you get up from a chair, standing stairs and chairs and combing hairs can be a problem with myositis. Raising your arms overhead to use, hold a hair dryer up uh, can be uh, next to impossible um, if you have proximal uh, arm weakness and getting up from a chair without using your arms can be impossible uh, if you have uh, leg weakness, proximal leg weakness. So where's the weakness? Some people will have head drop where they, the postural muscles are the muscles that help you hold your head up um, and uh, uh, other muscles in the trunk can be affected. Um, sometimes the diaphragm is affected. Uh, sometimes Breathing is affected not because of the diaphragm, but because of the lung itself gets affected. It's called interstitial lung disease. Um, and so the muscles might be fine, but the, the, the lungs are, are scarred. Uh, and so they can have, uh, you can have breathing problems, not because of weakness, but because of damage to the lungs. Um, we, oh, we try and ask uh, for uh, things, that make it, uh, things that make the weakness worse or better, or whatever the chief symptom, whatever the uh, main symptom is. Uh, does anything make it better? Does anything make it worse? There's something called myasthenia gravis, which also causes weakness. It tends to affect a different location. Myasthenia gravis tends to affect the eyes, cause double vision and droopy eyelids. It tends to affect speech, causing slurred speech. It can also cause trouble swallowing, but the trouble swallowing that people tend to have with myasthenia gravis tends to be more with liquids um, than solids, and the trouble that people with myositis seem to have more with solids more than liquids, and this is the only way to get something down is to take another gulp of water and try and force down because it's getting stuck like here and probably that's because the esophagus, the food pipe, is a muscle, and that muscle can get affected and it's not pushing things down, and so, um, uh, so uh, that seems to be why myositis tends to cause more swallowing problems with solids, and myasthenia and stroke or something else can cause more trouble with liquids. Uh, but it's not, it doesn't always happen that way because everything's different. Um, and so that's why we try and follow this pattern uh, because uh, uh, everyone is, really is different. Uh, so temporal factors, is, is it better in the morning, is it better in the evening? Something like myasthenia gravis is better in the morning. And as you do more and more later in the day, it gets worse, the double vision gets worse, or your speech gets worse, and myositis is pretty much bad all day long. Um, for, so when you wake up, you're really no better than you were the night before. There is some fatigue, um, and so you can have uh, a worsening during the day. If you're busier, you can have more weakness later in the day with uh, myositis, but with, with other conditions like myasthenia, there's more of, a, so more of a rapid drop during the day, and then it's better the next day, and then more of a rapid drop during the day. Uh, severity, uh, so how severe is your weakness, it's kind of hard to measure. You can't say like on the scale of 1 to 10, well how's your weakness today? That's hard to do. But I think what's more important is can you go up a flight of stairs? Can you go up a flight of stairs if there's no handrail? Or do you need one hand on a handrail? Or do you need two hands on a handrail? 
or do you need uh, to sit down to get up and down stairs, uh, or are they just off limits? Are stairs just impossible? So that's one measure of severity is how does it affect your ability to do this? Can you pour a gallon of jug of whatever milk or whatever with one hand? Or do you need to use two hands? Uh, can you do it with both hands? Or can you only do it with this hand? Um, and so that's kind of how I measure severity in, um, in myositis. Can you stand up from a chair without pushing on a rail or without can you get up from the ground without crawling over to a chair to push yourself up off the floor? Um, and then associated symptoms. Um, what else is, what are the symptoms are you having? When this started, when this weakness started, did anything else change? Did you notice anything like you were starting to have uh, fevers all the time or night sweats or, um, or these skin changes, this rash? Um, uh, so the other symptoms can also help us figure out uh, what's causing the problem. Okay, so then past medical history is another part of the, uh, of uh, getting the whole story. Uh, past medical history, what other, what other medical problems do you have? Do you have diabetes, high blood pressure, do you have thyroid disease because thyroid being too high or too low can affect uh, muscles. Um, thyroid being undertreated or overtreated can affect the muscles. Uh, diabetes, there are other endocrine problems like um, uh, cortisol, um, Addison's disease can cause uh, weakness because you don't have, your adrenals aren't working well enough. And so uh, uh, other symptoms can, can cause weakness um, and symptoms like myositis. Um, we always ask about other autoimmune conditions uh, because these tend to travel in pairs. Uh, someone might have had um, eczema or psoriasis or something like that. Uh, or someone, well, th th there, there are other uh, autoimmune diseases that tend to uh, occur a little more commonly in people who have myositis. Um, and of course, I'm asking about cholesterol because uh, have you been put on a statin lately? Because that's kind of the first thing I'm going to check is if you're on a statin and your, your uh, muscle enzymes are really high and your weakness is starting, uh, as soon as you got on the statin, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to consider coming off of the statin, uh, the medicine to use to, to lower cholesterol to see if, uh, if that is causing this problem. Do you have myositis or do you have statin-induced myopathy? Uh, because one of them goes away, almost always, but not always, uh, and the other one you can stop the statin and the myositis is still there. Um, uh, do you have have you been treated for cancer in the past um, with some type of chemotherapy, which can sometimes cause a muscle problem, a myositis or a myopathy? Uh, radiation therapy can cause uh, weakness, usually in the, if there was radiation here, you can develop weakness there. It shouldn't cause weakness other places, but sometimes there's radiation therapy here that can cause weakness in both legs and it can be a little confusing. Um, and then if there is uh, a history of cancer, um, well that's one of the things that we're supposed to look for. If someone is, is diagnosed with dermatomyositis or with uh, some of these uh, immune-mediated uh, necrotizing myopathies, um, we are we're going to use, uh, we're going to be a little more vigilant about looking for some kind of uh, underlying cancer, malignancy. Uh, have you had any back surgeries? So the first patient that I saw with IBM had two spine surgeries that maybe he didn't need because they were trying to fix this weakness that was creeping up. And then, oh, this is spinal stenosis. We can fix that uh, one surgery later. It didn't help. Uh, and then later on, another surgery occurred and, and 
the whole time he's just gradually getting weaker and weaker, having more and more trouble getting upstairs. Um, and uh, so we always ask about any, any past surgeries. If you've had gastric bypass surgery, um, you are at a little higher risk for problems absorbing, uh, especially B12, uh, copper, and a few other things. Uh, so if you've had gastric bypass surgery, we're going to always check your, your B12 level. We're always going to check your <coughs> copper level to see if something is off. Is this some kind of a, a metabolic thing causing your weakness? or is it actually the myositis? So, um, as far as, we're also going to ask about medications. Um, which medications uh, are you on now, and which medications have you been on in the past? The statins we're now discovering, uh, those are things like simvastatin, atorvastatin, lovastatin, uh, zocor, and think of the others, but um, these are, these are uh, very, very uh, effective drugs at lowering cholesterol and, uh, and delaying heart disease in people who have a tendency to, to have a high cholesterol. And so a lot of people get put on statins, um, and uh, a small percent of people who get put on statins are going to have a reaction it's going to affect their muscles, and it's going to cause something that looks very, very much like myositis. And, um, and so we're going to try and stop that medicine. Um, it's really a very small fraction of people who get put on these drugs, but when you put thousands or millions of people on a drug, a small number, a small fraction becomes a big number. So we pretty much always check uh, uh, the medication list uh, if someone's developed weakness that we think might be myositis. Uh, Azetimibe is called Zetia and it's another medicine to lower cholesterol and um, that has been if someone had a statin induced myopathy and they need to come off a statin I'm probably not going to put them on Zetia because it, it can also do the same thing in these other medicines called uh, gemfibrozil or fibrates. They're another medicine that can lower cholesterol. Um, even those have been associated with uh, myopathy. So it's a little tricky trying to treat cholesterol in someone who has myositis because you really don't want to put them on a statin. You don't want to put them on Zeta. You don't want to put them on uh, the fibrates. There are two or maybe three new medicines that have just come out for um, cholesterol, uh, which might be safe. Um, but of course, they're very expensive because they're brand new. Uh, but there are a couple of options out there that are probably worth trying if you are in this sort of catch-22 where your cholesterol is dangerously high but your myositis is also dangerously unstable and you don't want to risk starting a, a cholesterol medicine. Um, these new antibodies, they're monoclonal antibodies that, that uh, help to lower cholesterol, that might be an option. Uh, but anyway, we're gonna check to see if someone's been on statins, if, if they're developing symptoms of weakness, um, myalgias, um, and, uh, and we're gonna probably stop the statin until we know for sure that that's not what's going on. Um, steroids, uh, everyone's, most people in the room have been exposed to steroids at some point. Um, steroids can actually cause a myopathy. Um, and, uh, and it's, that could be really tricky if you're treating someone with uh, steroids for a muscle disease and, uh, and then they're getting worse. Is it because I'm giving too much steroids? Uh, are the steroids actually causing a problem? Um, and uh, and it, it, is, that the, uh, is that what is making you worse? Uh, the other possibility is that you've been on steroids 
and as you came off the steroids, your weakness was getting worse. Uh, so uh, steroids starting or stopping can, can be um, important. Uh, chemotherapy, I already mentioned that. Um, are you taking any cardiac medicines? A lot of uh, uh, like uh, blood pressure pills, there are some uh, medicines for arrhythmias, which can cause weakness. Um, there are some diuretics, water pills, uh, ISI, Lasix, things like that, that can cause your body to lose uh, too much of one electrolyte or too much of another electrolyte, and that can cause weakness if your electrolytes are off. Um, so we always ask about uh, those medicines. Um, uh, there are certainly some antibiotics which, which can cause weakness. Um, we, uh, uh, I always check magnesium. Uh, if you have any trouble <coughs> with uh, getting rid of things, like people who have renal failure, they, certain things can accumulate in their system uh, that would not accumulate if their kidneys were working normally. And, uh, and so if you have, um, if you have, if your kidneys are not working 100% and you're taking a medicine that has a lot of magnesium in it, um, and the magnesium can accumulate in your system, and so too much magnesium can cause weakness, um, which can be pretty severe. Uh, so uh, it's another medication to ask about. And then Botox, have you had Botox? Uh, because if you take a big enough dose of Botox, it will cause weakness. Um, it can cause weakness uh, in other places. Um, social history and occupational history, um, I mostly I want to know if, if you've been exposed to something. Alcohol. Alcohol can cause a myopathy. Um, uh, if you have a hobby of working with stained glass uh, and you get exposed to too much lead um, or, uh, or you work in a smelting plant or something like that, uh, you can get exposed to heavy metals. Um, not put out all twice, so I guess that was, uh, it's Kentucky, so. <laughs> um, so alcohol gets a double billing. All right, so family history, um, there are, uh, there are a couple of inherited myopathies which can look very much like uh, myositis, even with a biopsy. On the biopsy, it looks inflammatory, um, and, uh, and so if someone has uh, uh, slowly progressive proximal symmetric weakness, uh, stairs and chairs and combing hairs, and mom had the same thing, um, then I'm gonna be more worried about an inherited problem than an acquired problem like myositis. And with these things, these two, uh, the spirulinopathy and calpinopathy. These are called autosomal recessive, and um, autosomal recessive conditions are, there are carriers who don't have symptoms, and if mom's a carrier and dad is a carrier, and there's no family history, great aunts, maybe some remote distant family member that you don't, you've never met might have something, but it's possible to have a carrier, mom is a carrier or dad is a carrier, and one out of four kids uh, will get will get two bad copies of a gene, and they could get something like uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, one of those uh, medicines. So I'm always going to ask if anyone in the family has anything similar. Uh, and then. Um, when I go through this history, uh, when I'm talking to patients, uh, I've asked all these questions, um, and uh, if I forgot to ask something, then um, this review of systems is supposed to kind of uh, catch. This is, this is when you go in and you check off all the things that you've had, this really long list of uh, fevers, chills, night sweats, uh, nausea, vomiting, all that stuff. Um, because some of this might be pertinent, um, and so we always try and ask, we do a systematic review, start from the head, basically going from head to toe, what did I forget to ask is what this review system is. Um, because you know, we're not perfect, we're, we're trying to ask all the right questions, 
and uh, sometimes we forget to ask something very important that can tell you exactly what's going on. <coughs> I'm going backwards now. So that's the history. Um, that's the subjective. Uh, that's the first part of the soap notes. Is I get the subjective. Uh, what What do you notice? What have you noticed? Uh, then the next thing is to get some objective data, uh, like doing a physical exam. And when I check physical exam, I'm going to check strength. I'm going to check proximal muscles. I'm going to press check distal muscles. I'm going to check proximal muscles in the legs and distal muscles in the legs. I'm going to check muscles up here in the face. Um, raise your eyebrows, squeeze your eyes shut, and um, push your head forward and push your head backward. Uh, I'm going to check uh, sensation because um, myositis really shouldn't cause numbness. Um, myositis is only supposed to affect muscles, um, and if you have numbness or sensory loss or tingling or something, if that came along the same time that the initial symptom of weakness came along, uh, I'm going to wonder if I'm dealing with myositis or something else like CIDP or uh, multiple sclerosis or something that affects more than just muscles. Um, reflexes in general should be normal unless the muscles are so severe that they can't uh, everyone's been hit with a reflex hammer, I'm sure. Um, and uh, if, the, if the muscles are, um, if, you're, if you're strong enough to walk into the office, you're, you, you should have reflexes. Um, and so if reflexes are all gone, uh, then I'm worrying about something that's affecting the nerves, not so much the, something affecting the muscles. Um, until the muscles are really, if the muscles are really severe, then you might not have reflexes, but that's uh, usually a late problem. Um, with, uh, as far as checking gait, um, this is another one of those things of, uh, you know, it's hard to quantify, but if someone is coming in with no walker, no cane, no, uh, no uh, wheelchair, um, that's, that's one level of severity if someone is uh, needing a uh, a cane every time they leave the house, but they don't use it in the house, that's another level of severity. If someone is using a cane even to get from their bed to the bathroom, that's another level of severity. If someone needs a walker because a cane is not enough, if they, if the cane, if they kept falling be, even with a cane, that's another level, that's even more severe. And then if the, even the walker isn't enough, that's even more severe. So, um, uh, so how much assistance do you need to walk? Can you go upstairs? Um, and uh, the the gait, a waddling gait is is uh, a gait that people develop when they have had weakness for a, a long time. And um, normally, when you walk, you your hips will will keep your foot from scraping the floor. Your hip will kind of hike this side up so you can swing your leg forward without scraping the floor. But if you have weakness up here, every time you pick up this foot, it's gonna scrape on the floor. And so sometimes people will learn to walk like this because then they don't have to have, you can be weak and still walk without scraping your foot on the floor. And then there's another adaptation that you might see people walking around with a, uh, it's called lordosis, the lordotic gait. And I forget how that helps walking, but it's, it's a way that I've had patients come in, not with myositis, but with uh, 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 muscular dystrophy. And every time I saw them, I said, next year, this person is not going to be walking. And they come in next year, and they're still walking. And they figured out, even with these slowly worsening muscles, they figured out a way to stay on their feet. And, um, and it works. Um, and getting up the stairs can be really amazing the way that uh, they figured out the physics of, uh, of declining strength. 
uh, they've figured out ways to continue walking. Um, You're hanging on your ligaments. <laughs> that doesn't sound good. It sounds painful. <laughs> um, uh, and then skin, of course, we, we need to check to see if there's anything on the extensor surfaces um, because dermatomyositis tends to affect uh, these locations. The muscle that gets stretched when you do this when you do this, that muscle, that's uh, not muscle, sorry, the skin that gets stretched when you flex your fingers, when you flex your elbows, that tends to be affected uh, in dermatomyositis. And then some people will get this thing called the shawl sign or uh, a rash across the face, um, a malar rash. So we always want to check the skin um, if we're trying to figure out if this polymyositis, dermatomyositis, Inclusion by myositis or um, or uh, the necrotizing myopathy. There are three pages of labs, so you've all gone in this process. You probably had a couple of gallons of blood drawn. Uh, we always start with uh, creatine phosphokinase or CPK. Um, this is an enzyme that's supposed to stay inside of the muscles, and if muscles are damaged, this enzyme leaks out into the bloodstream. And so if there's a lot of muscle damage going on, the CPK is going to tend to be going uh, higher. Um, so CPK is something that um, is kind of an automatic thing. Uh, if you're worried about anything damaging muscles, you should be checking a CPK or CPK, or we should be checking a CPK. Um, and aldolase is kind of the same thing. And, and this number is another way to tell how are we doing. Let's say we've made the diagnosis and we're doing some treatment and let's say you're on this much steroids and you really want to come down on the steroids. We, we creep down on the steroids and we're going to watch the CPK. We're going to creep down on the steroids if the CPK is fine and the strength is okay. We're going to creep down a little more and keep coming down on the, on the steroids until either the symptoms, the weakness is coming back, or if the CK is going up. And I've had a patient who came in, his CK went up to like 3,000, but his strength was great. He said, I feel great. I said, okay, well, I don't, I, I'm treating you. I'm not treating a lab. I'm treating you, and you're doing fine, so carry on, and, and we'll, we'll cut down the steroids a little more. And he came in the next time, and his CK was up to 5,000. He felt great, and so I said, you know, I'm just treating you. I'm not treating a lab. I'm treating you. We can continue to come down on the steroids. Well, the next time I saw him, he couldn't stand up. He was in a chair. So ever since then, I've said, I'm, I'm treating you, but I'm, <laughs> I'm paying attention to this CK. I'm not going to ignore this lab anymore because I've learned my lesson pay attention to the CPK level because it can tell you if there's muscle damage going on. Um, Aldolase, again, same thing. Uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein are, um, they're not very helpful when they're high. They're really helpful when they're low. When, uh, if someone has a uh, some kind of infection, a urinary tract infection, even a splinter that's gotten infected and you get some cellulitis, you can have a sed rate that goes up or a C-reactive protein that goes up. It doesn't tell you where the problem is. It just tells you there's some kind of inflammation somewhere. And so uh, if I'm coming down on steroids or if I've got a new patient with weakness and I want to know is this some kind of inflammatory thing, the ESR, the sed sedimentation rate, and the C-reactive protein are a good way to kind of see is there any inflammation going on because um, the, this number tends to be very high, can be very high, not, not always, but it, it, it's usually high enough to, to raise some kind of suspicion of an inflammatory thing. Myositis is inflammation, so uh, CRP and sed rate are important to check. Uh, B12, I check it in everyone. Um, anyone who comes in to my office, I almost always check a B12. Um, a complete metabolic profile is kind of that basic thing of sodium, potassium, chloride. Um, 
uh, and then these are sometimes called liver enzymes. AST and ALT, if I call them liver enzymes, I'm going to forget that these are very much like the CPK on the alveolase. These AST and ALT, uh, I can't even tell you what they stand for. But AST and ALT are, are enzymes that are called liver enzymes. And I've had a couple of patients who actually had a liver biopsy because their liver enzymes were high, and it turns out that it was okay too. <laughs> and it was normal, the liver looks great, uh, because the AST and ALT are not liver enzymes, they're called transaminases, and they can come from muscles being damaged too. So I, 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 I work at the medical school, we have students and residents, and I wait for them to say liver enzymes so I can pounce on them and say, do not call them liver enzymes. They are transaminases. If you call them liver enzymes, you're gonna forget that they can come from other places besides the liver. So, uh, uh, and then magnesium, I always check magnesium. Uh, complete blood count, um, if there's an infection, um, if you're anemic, uh, that can cause weakness or fatigue for sure. Um, thyroid function, we always check that. ANA, rheumatoid factor, show SSA and SSB are for autoimmune diseases, uh, inflammatory diseases, um, lupus. Uh, those labs are, are kind of like those, kind of like the sed rate and C-reactive protein. It doesn't tell us what's going on, but it tells us something's going on. There's something maybe inflammatory. And if, if one of those is high enough, I'm, I'm usually gonna ask for a rheumatologist to kind of do a little more detailed testing to see is this lupus and does it need this kind of treatment or is it really just myositis that needs that kind of treatment. Um, other endocrine uh, conditions, um, uh, hemoglobin A1C is, if, if anyone is on um, a high enough dose of steroids, you probably know what a hemoglobin A1C is, or if you have diabetes, you should know what hemoglobin A1C is. This is kind of like a report card uh, of what your sugars have been doing for the past few months. Uh, so if your sugars have been running in the 200s uh, for the past three months, your hemoglobin A1C is going to be like a seven or an eight or something like that, um, and that's too high. So the hemoglobin A1C will kind of tell us have your sugars been running high for the past few months, and maybe is that the reason that you're feeling fatigue uh, or run down or thirsty all the time or peeing all the time? Um, cortisol is um, a, another uh, hormone uh, that can make you feel weak if it's too low. Um, PTH is uh, a hormone that controls um, calcium levels, and it, it's important for bone, keeping the calcium in the bones and not letting it go out uh, in the urine, and, uh, and so if PTH is off, that can sometimes cause weakness. That was page one of the labs. Page two of the labs. If we think that you have myositis, uh, I used to not check these, uh, because I thought, well, I'm just gonna get biopsy, but these are actually very important, um, so now I check them. Uh, I, I check them in everyone that I think has myositis. Um, the reason I check them is this one. If someone has myositis and they have this TIF one, this is a gamma, Y, well, it's not a Y, it's a gamma, but my computer didn't have a gamma. So TIF one gamma, anti-TIF one gamma, if that's positive, it's something like a 75% chance of some kind of malignancy somewhere. So um, I'm gonna be even more vigilant do more testing for some kind of malignancy if you've got myositis with this antibody. If you have MDA5, um, that is usually going to be a dermatomyositis which doesn't really affect the muscles. It can affect the muscles, but most of the time it's just a dermato sans myositis. Um, and it can cause the exact same skin changes that dermatomyositis cause, but it doesn't really cause uh, muscle problems, but people with MDA5 can have uh, amyopathic dermatomyositis, but they can have really severe interstitial lung disease. So if MDA5 is positive, we need to get a good 
uh, CAT scan of the chest to look for fibrosis or some kind of uh, damage to the lungs. Uh, Whatever is damaging the skin is also affecting the alveoli and the and, uh, inside of the lungs. So uh, this is the this is kind of the newest uh, player on. Well, actually, these these two are new. Uh, this NT5C1A came out about five years ago. Until this came out, um, our ability to tell someone confidently that they had inclusion body myositis and they don't need IVIG or steroids or Celsept or Imuran or any methotrexate, um, our ability was based on if the biopsy showed these things called rim vacuoles or behind these classic <coughs> findings, and sometimes the biopsy in, in IBM is not definite, um, this antibody is, is pretty definite. If you have weakness where you can't do this anymore, you have to do this, you can't, you may ask someone to make a fist and they, and they can't curl these fingers, uh, and you can't spray a spray can, uh, you can't you can't put Pam on your cooking pan, on your cooking uh, surface because you can't depress that button. Um, that is actually how one of my, the first symptom of one of my patients was she could not uh, put hairspray on, couldn't push this button because this muscle was too weak. So if someone has weakness here in these muscles uh, and they have a little elevation in the CK, and they have this antibody, you almost don't need a biopsy. We're still gonna do one because if it's treatable with steroids or something, I, I wanna treat it, but it's really likely to be IBM if you have this NT5C1 antibody. Yes? And is that weakness always symmetrical? Uh, no. no. As a, uh, more than, probably more than 50% of the time, it starts off one arm is worse than the other. Um, and so if you ever see these pictures in the textbooks uh, or articles or anything like that, uh, you'll see a picture of someone doing this and you'll always see one side is, is closed all more than the other. Um, it tends to be, uh, and I don't know if it's dominant, I don't think it's dominant hand or non-dominant hand, but it does tend to be asymmetric. Uh, when it starts, um, and then it, and then uh, these muscles, uh, the the, uh, the the quadriceps muscles that extend the knee are supposed to be affected. This has been for me, for my patients, this has been more um, telltale than these muscles. For me, uh, people, my patients with IBM is just kind of everywhere, the legs down. But this is the really classic. Uh, finding because these are still strong and so when we think of myopathy we think of proximal symmetric we think that these are usually worse than than uh, these but in IBM this is that kind of the exception to that rule uh, it causes more weakness out here than it does up here um, so this other one um, HMGCR is uh, sort of the newest antibody that uh, if someone comes to me, they've been on a statin and they're CK, they're weak, uh, they can't do stairs and chairs, and, they, uh, and they're on a statin, we're gonna stop the statin. And if they get better and it goes away and it never comes back, we're done, we're just blaming it on the statin. But if it gets a little better, and then six months after you stop the statin, if the weakness is still getting worse, I'm gonna check this antibody because um, there's something about the Zocor, Lipitor, we're not sure. Um, but in some percent of people, small percent of people who take statins, they, I'm not going to say trigger because I'm not. I don't want to get any lawyers excited. Uh, and, but it's, there's some association between statins and this immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy that has these anti-HMGCR antibodies. 
I'm not going to say it's uh, always connected because there are some people, even kids, who have um, have these antibodies and they've never been exposed to a statin. They've never taken a Zocor or a Lipitor or anything like that. So it's not uh, it's not always caused by being on a statin. But um, if someone has had uh, myositis and they have these antibodies, they really should never be on a, a statin again. Um, at least that's that's kind of how I'm working right now, and maybe in the future I'll have a reason to change. But at this point, I don't have a reason to put anyone with this antibody back on a statin. And and then there's more labs, and this is the last page of labs. Um, but if uh, if someone has a lot of uh, droopy eyelids, double vision, slurred speech, those are things that aren't really uh, as common with myositis as they are with something like myasthenia gravis. And so if someone has uh, weakness that gets worse as the day goes on, their speech gets worse as the day goes on, they go and lay down for just a half an hour and they wake up and their eyes are all better. And they're not even sleeping. They go and they just close their eyes. They're not sleepy. They just close their eyes to rest them. And then half an hour after half an hour of rest, their eyes are wide open. Their double vision has gone away. Uh, their strength is better. Um, and then they kind of they, their battery runs out, like the energizer or whatever the energizer. But they, they, their battery runs out too quickly. That's more like myasthenia gravis. Uh, so if I'm thinking that, I'm going to check these other antibodies. If someone has a lot of sensory disturbances, or they came, and when this all started, the first time I saw them, or the first some some other doctor saw them and checked their reflexes, if they didn't have reflexes when this very first started, I'm going to look for something called CIDP or Guillain-Barré syndrome or or multiple sclerosis. If I'm thinking of if there's a lot of sensory disturbances, or if there's uh, double vision or loss of vision or something else, uh, or any bowel or bladder problems. I'm going to look for something called multiple sclerosis. Um, if you're from uh, Lyme, Connecticut, or if, you're, if I'm seeing someone from uh, anywhere uh, in the Northeast, I'm going to check Lyme titers. Um, there's, uh, uh, sometimes I'll check these other things called lactate, pyruvate. Uh, there are some conditions called metabolic myopathies where you're your muscles, uh, normal muscles are able to run on two types of fuel. They can run on carbs and they can run on lipids. And some people have a, a, an enzyme that's missing. They can run on carbs, but they can't run on lipids. Or vice versa, they can run on lipids, but they can't run on carbs. And so that's called a metabolic myopathy. And so uh, sometimes we'll check the, the lactate or the pyruvate or the carnitine, which tend to build up if someone is missing an enzyme there's some point where these things start to accumulate and, and so we'll check uh, these things for uh, part of this work. Uh, I thought Lyme titers were not found in the blood. They were <coughs> found in certain areas of the body. Um, if you have a working immune system, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're immune suppressed, mm -hmm. like if you have HIV or if you have um, or if you're on drugs that lower your immune system, then you might not have these antibodies. Um, but if you have a working immune system, your immune system is going to make antibodies that recognize Lyme. And, and it's going to show up in the blood. Um, there are, uh, there's a first set of labs, and then there's a second set of labs. And if the first set of labs is negative, I don't do the second set of labs. Um, but there are some doctors who will do the second set of labs, and there's always something that looks a little fishy, but it doesn't mean you have Lyme disease. And it's, it's a little confusing. Uh, actually, it's not confusing. It's, uh, there, there are uh, some physicians who will treat anyone for Lyme disease, whether they have it or not. And they'll do the second set of tests, and they'll say, "Oh, look! Here's here's your antibody. You have one, two of these ten. We're going to treat this. Um, it's not really appropriate, uh, in my in my view. Mm -hmm. um, if the first set, if you're unless you have some immune deficiency, 
the Lyme titers, the, the antibodies should tell us uh, if you've had, if you've been exposed to Lyme. So, <coughs> wow, we have gotten to the neurodi. Oh, now this is this my favorite part. This is the part where we shock you and poke you with needles. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so we're we're checking to see. <coughs> The nerves should not be affected. If you have myositis, your nerves should carry a normal signal. The sensory nerves and the motor nerves should carry a normal signal. And, uh, and if you have myasthenia gravis, your neuromuscular junction, the connection between the nerve and the muscle, should work uh, normally. And so I don't know, has anyone had uh, something called repetitive nerve stimulation? Where uh, they, they hook you up, you know, they, they put their recording electrodes here, and they do a little stimulator. And then we go pop, 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 pop. Mm -hmm. that's, re that's repetitive nerve stimulation. That's kind of a stress test of the neuromuscular junction because in people who do not have myasthenia gravis, pop, 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 uh, they look all the same. That, that system will not fail unless you have a problem with uh, the connection between the nerve and the muscle, which is myasthenia gravis. The muscle is fine. The nerves are fine. The junction between the two is broken. And that little rep stim, that wonderful rep stim test, uh, is the way to detect that. Um, the sensory nerves should definitely be normal in myositis, and the motor nerves that should be normal certainly early in myositis. But if the muscles get really severely affected, uh, the nerves might look uh, abnormal because the muscles are too sick to to show that the nerves are working. Um, but nerve conductions are typically normal in myositis. And then the needle part is uh, focal, focal needling to some muscles. And uh, and when I and I had a little demonstration but I couldn't couldn't get it on here. But um, but you probably all heard what an EMG sounds like. Um, so when I, when I poke a needle into a muscle, I'm listening to the electrical activity of the muscle. As soon as I stop moving the needle, the muscle should be silent. And, and in, uh, in myositis, I poke the needle and there's all this tick, 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 tick noise, all these noises that occur <coughs> that uh, are the muscle membrane is unstable. Um, and the muscle membrane is irritated for some reason. It could be from nerve or it could be from muscle. It doesn't tell us um, whether it's a nerve problem or a muscle problem until we have the first, until we have you contract that muscle and then we hear what does it sound like when you're trying to get that muscle to fire. Um, the difference between a nerve problem causing weakness and a muscle problem causing weakness that's where you separate those two. When, when the muscles start firing, with one way it sounds very different. Uh, if the nerves are sick and that's causing the problem, then when the muscles are sick and that's causing the problem. So, um, so that's what the EMG is for and we just haven't come up with anything less painful than the EMG. Um, so, I'm sorry. Um, what does it mean when you, what your hands are doing? It means that they use a really big needle. It's a painful test. Uh, I've actually had people sleep through the whole study. Uh, and, and that is, if that happens, then I'm, I guarantee they either have uh, sleep apnea, really bad sleep apnea. <laughs> or they are really on too much medicine because no one should sleep through this test. I mean, it'd be nice if you could, but uh, if you sleep through this test, I'm a little more worried <laughs> about something else besides, uh, besides the myositis. So we've, uh, we've <coughs> some imaging. Sometimes we'll check um, an MRI. Uh, this is me being a snob um, because <laughs> Some people don't know how to do a neuro exam, and so they say, well, let's just get an MRI. Um, but 
Uh, I will, even myself, an arrogant neurologist like myself, will sometimes order an MRI because um, it can show some changes in a muscle and it can sometimes be helpful to choose a muscle. Like uh, I did this last year on a patient, he had one muscle biopsy. They, they checked the wrong muscle. They, they checked, his weakness was here and they checked this muscle, this muscle was fine. And so I said, we're only gonna do one more muscle. I wanna make sure that we get the right muscle. We're gonna do an MRI because I wanna make sure that, that we are checking. I think, it's, I think that this is the right muscle or this is the right muscle. And so I wanna get an MRI because whichever one looks a little worse is the one that we're gonna get a biopsy. We're only gonna do one more biopsy. That's, that's when it's time to use an MRI. It's, um, is to sort of help select a muscle for a biopsy. It could probably, uh, MRI of muscles could probably be used to, to decide on whether your treatment is working too, uh, but it gets kind of expensive to do MRI after MRI after MRI. Um, so we'll just do a, a, an exam and check your strength and check your CK and things like that. Um, so MRI of muscles is, is uh, sometimes useful. Uh, ultrasound of muscles is uh, coming around. It's not really there yet, but um, uh, it's, it's really easy. It's a machine you can have at the bedside and you can get a quick look at the muscles. Um, it's just not, not quite there yet. Um, it is getting, those are getting um, better and better and so there could be a time when um, we don't need to do MRIs to look for muscles to biopsy. We could just use an uh, ultrasound and just say, oh, this is the muscle that we want. A CAT scan, a CT of the chest, computed tomography. A CAT scan of the chest is uh, important if you're worried about some kind of lung disease, interstitial lung disease, um, and uh, or as part of the searching for a cancer. If if if, uh, if a person with dermatomyositis has been a smoker for 20 years, we're going to get a CAT scan of the chest. We're going to look for uh, we're going to look for any kind of tumors, actually chest, abdomen, pelvis, we're going to look uh, for um, some kind of malignancy because if it's there, if we can get rid of it, we might be able to get rid of the, the myositis by getting rid of the cancer. Um, and then uh, we'll sometimes get a swallow study, it's, it's technically an imaging study or a radiology study. Um, the fluoroscopic swallow study is one that's done with the speech therapist where you, they have you eat the peaches and the uh, drink the nectar thick liquids and the honey thick liquids and um, and that's checking the swallowing from here to here. If you tell me that, that your problem is steak, pizza crust, bagels, getting stuck right here, uh, the better study is going to be an esophagram which actually checks the transit from here down to, to here. The swallow study is good getting the food into the food pipe and the esophagram is good at measuring the food going down the food pipe into the stomach. Do I want to know how that's done? Uh, you, you drink some barium milky stuff. Um, it's, the same, it's the same stuff. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> at, but they give you a tablet. I don't think they give you a tablet, barium tablet, when you do the regular swallow study. When you do the esophagram, they give you a tablet that's kind of big. Because if there's a narrowing, some people don't have, some people the muscle is normal, but they have something called a stricture, mm -hmm. where the tube is supposed to, the food pipe is supposed to open up and then squeeze down, and some people have a stricture where it won't open up and that tablet <laughs> will stop, and they'll say, oh, well, you have a stricture right here, and then they just go in and they do a little dilation and stretch it out. Um, and so that's the esophagram. All right, oh, and then the biopsy. And this, uh, this background is a biopsy. Background is a biopsy from, uh, anybody know what kind of myositis? So this is um, the, the one caused by the statin. Uh, uh, these are little macrophage 
this is nor this is muscle, 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 muscle cell, and then these are little uh, macrophages, uh, which are uh, supposed to be going in and cleaning up damaged tissue. Um, so the biopsy is sometimes the only way to uh, know for sure that you're dealing with either IBM, polymyositis, dermatomyositis, immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy, um, and they they each have a little different um, pattern in the in the biopsy. Uh, the dermatomyositis is kind of interesting. Um, in polymyositis, the immune cells are actually going into the tissue and they're directly attacking uh, those muscle fibers. And in dermatomyositis, it's almost like the immune cells are attacking the vessels that supply the muscles and the muscle fibers that are affected are the ones that are furthest away from the vessels because they're not getting enough blood supply because it's kind of like a vasculitis uh, of the muscle. So it's, it, the immune system is causing the vessel to, to stop working properly and then this part of the muscle that's so far away from the source of nutrients and oxygen and everything, that's the part that shows up as sick in the, uh, in the biopsy of dermatomyositis. So there's something called perifascicular atrophy and what that's describing is the muscle fibers that are furthest from the vessel are the ones that look atrophic, they look small and sick, and, um, and the immune cells are all huddled around the vessels. Um, so it's possible that your myositis is actually a vasculitis and the muscle is just trying to get a blood supply. Um, but polymyositis and IBM, the immune system is actually attacking the muscle or, well, uh, IBM, it looks like the immune system is attacking the muscle and yet everything that we use to tell the immune system to leave the muscle alone doesn't work. Um, and then immune-mediated mediated necrotizing myopathy um, is the one that they either have uh, HMG-CR antibody or this SRP antibody. Um, and this is another one where we, we pretty much always have to look for some kind of malignancy. Um, if, we're, if we make this diagnosis, we need to look and see, is there some kind of cancer uh, what caused this? What caused the immune system to start attacking the muscles? And let's go back to, okay, other. I don't even know what's under other. Oh yeah, pulmonary function testing. Uh, the diaphragm is a muscle. The chest wall. The chest wall helps you <coughs> cough. Uh, the chest wall helps you move air out. The diaphragm helps you move air in. Uh, the pulmonary function testing is a way to check how well those muscles are working. Um, how often do you do that? Uh, if someone's having a breathing problems, I'll do it more often. <laughs> I mean, I had it done when I was first diagnosed. Here I am three years later, I haven't had it done since. So, so uh, I will, it, it depends on symptoms. Um, uh, if, you, uh, if you could go up a flight of stairs without any trouble, or two flights of stairs. I'm, I'm not too worried about your breathing. Um, and, and usually when I ask people, uh, or if, I'll say, if you go to the little high, high school track and you walk around the track, can you make it all the way around without stopping? And if they say no, I say, well, what stops you? If they say, I'm huffing and puffing, I'm gonna do a pulmonary function test. If they say, my legs are gonna give out, I'm, if the legs are the limiting factor, and the breathing doesn't sound like it's an issue, I'm not too worried about doing a pulmonary function test. If uh, the early symptoms of, of the diaphragm being weak, the chest wall being weak, would be things that are, they sound very much like sleep apnea. You wake up every morning with a headache. You wake up in the morning and you just feel like you don't feel rested. Uh, you're yawning during the day or you sit down in a chair and you fall asleep as soon as the room gets quiet. I don't see it. So no one has sleep apnea. If you're staying awake during this whole talk, no one here has sleep apnea. Or uh, your breathing function is pretty good at night. But if you, if you have weak diaphragm and weak chest wall and you lay down, 
Uh, and some people will start getting shorter breath, feeling smothered just from laying down, laying flat. Mm -hmm. So those are the symptoms that I ask. That's when I want to know about pulmonary function is, is uh, do you get shorter breath when you lay flat? Do you wake up with a headache every morning? Do you fall asleep at the drop of a hat? Uh, or at a stoplight, uh, do you uh, are you yawning const yawning constantly? Um, that's what I'm going to check pulmonary function. But m a lot of uh, forms of myositis don't affect the muscles, the don't affect the breathing. Uh, now, if you have that MDA five, or if you have the one of the types of myositis that affects the lungs, if you have interstitial lung disease, then I think probably every year. I don't, I don't know. If someone has interstitial lung disease, it is now moved outside of my area of comfort. I'm going to ask a pulmonologist to tell me how often do you need the pulmonary function test because uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tissue that I don't understand. It's the alveoli. It's the, uh, 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 if you have interstitial lung disease, it's probably going to be once a year, but I don't know. Uh, you're going to see a pulmonologist, <laughs> uh, and they're going to they're going to set the, the schedule, and they might just want to do a, a CAT scan of the chest again. I'm not sure. Um, urine myoglobin is um, if your CK gets super high. Um, the CK is actually not damaging to the kidneys, but there's another muscle uh, enzyme that leaks out of the muscles that can damage the kidneys, and uh, and if the CK is really high, I want to check the urine myoglobin to see if, if, the, if the kidneys are at risk from uh, rhabdomyolysis. Um, we'll also, uh, like in the patient who just has lower extremity symptoms, um, I'm probably going to check an MRI of the spine because uh, maybe they have something called spinal stenosis and they don't have myositis. Um, but if the arms are affected, then it's it's not going to be the lumbar spine anymore. So that is the objective. And this is all in a quick, you know, quick document. Oh, I'm running. Out. We're running over. Okay, I'm actually very close to being done because let's see what's here. Oh no, let's go back. I'm jumping ahead. Really, just a couple more slides. The assessment is what's going on. Um, but all these uh, labs and, and uh, findings and imaging and EMG and biopsy together and figure out what's the most likely explanation for this. And since we're not right all the time, we should always come up with a plan B because your first guess is not always correct. Your second guess is not always correct. So it's always a good idea to say, well, if it's not this, then I think maybe it's this, maybe it's this. Uh, and here's why I think this is more likely. Here's why I think that's more likely. And that's basically, that's our formula. That's how we, that's how we try and arrive at a plan. Um, if this is the diagnosis, what are we going to do? If it's not definitely the diagnosis, what are we going to do to figure out what the definite diagnosis is? Um, and, uh, and so there should, you, you, there should always be a plan. Uh, I've, I've really found that if nothing else, even if I don't know what's going on, people like to know that there's a plan, something Here's what we're going to do. Uh, I, I think that's huge. Uh, so don't leave your doctor's office without a plan. And I think that's it. Any questions? Treatment, not diagnosis, but. Oh, yeah, it's another talk. Now, Well, I found out here that just because my doctor always says that my lab work is really good and my muscle test, whichever one that is, which one is that, they, they check the enzymes that are being swept off. CK and aldolase. That um, I said, well, what if my, uh, if there, if those tests are all, my muscle uh, test CK is always good, how come I'm losing from my ability? And so people said, oh, the CK is just one way to tell if the muscles are are getting damaged. Um, and and we go back to the plan. Are we sure of the diagnosis? <laughs> um, and then. Uh, uh, 
the CK is a way to tell if there's active muscle damage. Um, if things are getting worse and the CK is not high and the alveolase isn't high and the sed rate isn't high, and it's, I, I, I want to go back and look at, start over. Just look at, look at the list of things again. Go through this whole process again. When did it start? What made it worse? What made it better? What's been tried? What does biopsy look like? Um, I, so if, if you're not getting, if things are getting worse, and uh, if you don't, if you don't have uh, an answer, then you need to keep asking questions, and maybe a different, you know, get uh, uh, ask someone else. Um, would you recommend um, just because it's a little bit over, and we're going to start another event? Um, so if anyone wanted to stay and ask questions, would yeah. that be okay? Then, yeah, absolutely. Um, please just don't forget to fill out your surveys and, and leave those if you want to stay and ask some questions. Um, but we'll just give people a moment to transition out yes. if you have some part. If you want to take a little break before the uh, five o'clock. Whoa, I went way over. Sorry. <laughs> 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 strange word 
that no one's heard. It's myositis. There's an annual patient conference, which is just second to none, where you'll learn a lot and network, and you'll also have some fun. And their website is updated with a lot of current news, with lots of info and resources, and much more that you can use, like info TMA compiles, and like lists of clinical trials, and lists of research too, you can review, cause it's all there for you. So hooray for the group TMA, it's the Myositis Association, helping patients become peers, now for the past 25 years. So if you have been diagnosed, here's an organization to unite us, a quarter century they can the group that's got the scoop on myositis. 